Welcome to the Eastern Innovation Eastern Vic Founders Meetup. Online with Dr. Scott Valentine talking all things for thought leaders and innovators on the circular economy. It's our first online Zoom call and we hope you enjoy the recording. So hello and welcome. Welcome to Eastern Innovation's very first uh, Eastern Vic Founders Meetup online session. Yay! Uh, well now, you, you, for those of you who have joined us before in the past at Eastern Innovation, you'll know that we come in, we have pizza, we have wine, we have beer, but beer that's supplied by some of our amazing uh, um, brew specialists. Um, so I have here my glass of wine. I don't know if anyone else has gone, a few other people have got their bottle under the table. I'm just letting you know it's okay. All right, we're not going to change the uh, agenda too much. I don't know if anybody ordered pizza. Uh, but um, we promise you lots of pizza when this is all over and we're all back together face to face. It's, um, it's been a really uh, amazing time. Uh, I want to just reach out and give you all virtual hugs for the huggers of us. We're all missing uh, the hug. Um, we're all sometimes wondering what's going on. I just want to let you know at the very beginning and I'll let you know at the end that we are absolutely here for you. Our team have been working madly and crazily and all hours to bring you so much online so much virtual and so much um, mentoring and coaching and whatever it is you need to get you to the next level but I'll get to all of that later um, so we have online there's about 50 of us coming on board um, a massive shout out to both Alira and uh, to Liz our team and of course Henny doing some background stuff um, who have made it possible to do this online. A huge hello to our special, special uh, guest today, uh, to Dr. Scott Valentine. Uh, he's going to give us a presentation in about five minutes for about 30 minutes. That's going to happen. He's going to talk about understanding the circular economy. Uh, he's going to talk about the opportunities for thought leaders and startups and innovators um, around the circular economy um, what it is that we'll be able to hit the ground running with over the next two years. Because uh, there is um, very much a focus right now on our earth and, and how we can continue to have a place and a space where we can continue to thrive. Uh, and I'll introduce Scott and tell you about how amazing he is. We've got quite a number of people online who are internationally with us. Uh, I uh, We just... Um, uh, had a chat to, and now I've gone completely mind like I think uh, Martin, um, uh, just give me a quick shout out. And I know, I know Mark Sims, you're, you've just arrived back in Hong Kong. Yep. Giving oh, us a wave. Great. great. Uh, and, um, and other well, people fine. who have jumped online. So we've got plenty of time for questions, plenty of time for introductions a little bit later on. So let me get into uh, Dr. Scott's Valentine Scott, our friend Scott. I met Scott uh, when um, a wonderful group of collaborators came to the centre and said, uh, we know that the Victorian state government are focusing on the circular economy right now. We know they're looking to write a paper to help business understand what the circular economy is, what our responsibility is, but probably more importantly, what the opportunities are. And this group was uh, Angela Stubbs from the city of Kingston. Um, uh, Mike uh, Kressner from... Uh, no, it's not Mike. Help me out here, Scott. Uh, Ian Davies. Ian Davies, that's yeah. right. He's, and he's online too, so feel free to slap me down, Ian. Sorry. Ian Davies from the City of Hume uh, and um, some team from the, uh, from the um, university. Help me out, Scott. So yes. I get to yes. show you it's not perfect. M M Monique Saint-Tropez -Saint yeah. from, uh, from La Trobe University. Yep, La Trobe yep. University. And they're coming together to work on, um, hang on, one of my colleagues is asking me a question. Seven. Um, it's, it's great. I've got a girlfriend who's got three cats and they're all her colleagues. So, uh, we, you know, I'm sure you all know the feeling. Okay, so um, all coming together to help businesses across both Kingston and Hume and everywhere in between to understand uh, what the circular economy could mean and they were focusing on food industries. We offered to host them at Eastern Innovation so that they could begin to work on what they're working on. I know Scott's going to tell us a little bit more about that. Scott has over 30 years of international business experience in sales, advertising, marketing and business development. He led startups um, of four businesses in Asia, 
and successfully implemented business re-engineering projects in the Philippines, Brazil, Hong Kong, and Tunisia. I'll tell you what, Scott, re-engineering products, business hmm. re-engineering. Wow, aren't we looking at that right now? He currently uh, works for KPMG as the Senior Circular Economy Specialist. Uh, he helps firms with KPMG to create and implement circular economy strategies, working with governments to establish support strategies, advising on energy efficiency, energy transitions in both public and the private sector. So um, everybody just give a little two-handed wave to Scott and over to you, Scott. Great, well, thank you. Thanks, Danielle. Um, I, I, well, I mean, first of all, both to yourself, to Alira and to Liz, thank you so much for uh, hosting this and for uh, inviting me. Uh, I actually don't, I, I haven't done a lot of this in the past live, so it's kind of fun to be able to do it and uh, learn by error, I guess, is, uh, so don't expect a lot. Um, Danielle is right. Uh, that you know this we should we should still maintain the the social spirit so make sure that you get yourself a drink uh, I can assure you that I'm far more entertaining if you've had a few drinks um, basically the the thought for today is you know what's the circular economy about uh, we've all heard it being bantied about and you know some some of you that are, that are have joined us here are, are working in the industry so this is all old hat but I wanted to give a, a presentation that looked at th the circular economy from a strategic business lens so if I may uh, let me just start by you know stepping back one to look at why the circular economy has has become such a talking topic around the world and it really begins um, with the demands that we're seeing being placed on, on on the planet as a result of increasing affluence plus increasing population so you know we're looking at a, a world where we're going to have nine billion people by 2050 affluence is is guaranteed to be increasing and as a result of that we're putting increasing 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 pressure on our resources and you know it, it doesn't take a take a a, a uh, you know economist to to make you realize that you know when you've got finite resources and you keep drawing them down you get yourself into a situation where you know eventually you hit a wall of scarcity and when you hit a wall of scarcity you better either have some substitutes or you better be able to afford the input impact of prices and so I, I wanted to introduce this chart because this kind of highlights some of the challenges that we have now this is productions to reserve ratio so what that means is each year how much do we produce and reserves how much do we think we have uh, you know in various different deposits around the world now this is a, a bit of a, um, a you know a, a, a flexible or a malleable statistic because reserves can always change as you begin to uh, you know search for more resources but let me ask you this are you are you aware of any you know mining operation where you know their costs of doing business are cheaper because they're having to do you know dig deeper the answer of course is no the more that we are searching for new discoveries we have to go to more remote places you know and as a result of that everything is going to become more expensive so We've got a little bit of a conundrum there. And that fits in quite interestingly with the whole notion of competitive advantage. And we've been talking about this in Australia. What's, what's the new big wave for competitive advantage for Australia? Because you, you think about this, we've got, you know, uh, everyone is using the same technology nowadays you, you walk into a plant in China and it's the same as the plant that's in Japan and it's the same that you know as the plant that's here in Australia so everybody's you know working from the same you know uh, uh, level playing field there in terms of managing people everyone's gone to the same MBA courses you know they've taken the same they, they've employed the same strategies and as a result of that uh, you know the way that we manage people uh, and manage performance 
really is not something that we can differentiate. And then finally, you know, looking at operations, how do we, you know, streamline our operations, just in time management, Kaizen, all of these terms that seem so, you know, mysterious 20 years ago are now, you know, terms that every company is employing in order to improve their operations. So again, the question is, where is the competitive advantage? And Europe has answered that question, and I know Martin will be shaking his head in, in agreement on this. Um, Europe has answered this question by saying, wait a minute, our advantage is actually taking these resources that we know are going to become more and more costly and utilizing them in a far more efficient manner. And so, you know, we've seen, a, you know, a number of reports come out. One's, one's come out just recently called the Circularity Gap Report, where uh, they've basically made the statement that the world currently is, is only 9% circular, meaning that 91% of our resources we're just taking, using, disposing. So there are ways in which we can actually begin to, you know, improve our operations, save on money, innovate, and at the same time, reduce our ecological footprint. It's, it's the new way to be green and be gold at the same time. And that's pretty exciting to me. But it doesn't really help us, you know, when we're talking about the macro view, because, uh, you know, often when, when you talk about the circular economy, you see this diagram here. This is called uh, the circular economy butterfly, and it's created by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which is a wonderful resource if you're looking for information on the circular economy. Uh, they've got uh, numerous uh, sectoral reports and analysis, so I'd encourage you to, to stop by there if you're, if you're looking for more information. But what this chart is really telling you with all of these loops, and I guess you can maybe see my cursor here, you can see the loops coming up and through from the, from the end user. What this is really telling us is the circular economy is about taking resources that are coming out the end pipe as waste and somehow finding a way to get it back into the supply chain. And if we can do so, instead of it just being a cost that we've thrown away, we've taken that cost and we've moved it back into the system again. So, you know, we, we offset or reduce future costs. What I wanted to highlight though, for those of us that are in Australia is, you know, a lot of talk has been, uh, you know, uh, along the lines of the circular economy and recycling being synonymous, and it isn't. And if you look at this butterfly diagram, you can see why it isn't. Recycling is something that is the last thing you want to do before you burn something. So in the hierarchy of dealing with resources, the first thing you want to do is try and fix it. The next thing you want to do is somehow reuse it without having to significantly alter it. And the, the third thing you want to do is you want to refurbish it. Why? Well, think about a, a glass. Let's, let's take a glass jar, right? You've got this lovely glass jar. It's gone through a process. The process is you've taken a bunch of silicates, some sand, energy, you've put it all together with some chemicals, and you've created through a machine and through people's labor, a lovely jar into which you can put things. Well, that's not just a jar anymore, is it? It's not just a glass resource. It is the combination of all of the contents that have gone into the making of the jar, plus the labor, plus the rents, plus the machines, and all the operating costs of the company that made that jar. So when you take it and you recycle it, you crush it down and recycle it, there, there's nothing wrong with that. But when you, when you do so, what you're doing is you're also crushing the labor, crushing the investment that went into making that jar. So that's why it's not, you know, you know, the, 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 the top priority for most of us that are working in the circular economy. Now, all of this stuff doesn't, I know, probably help too much for those of you that are new to the circular economy and you've come in and you're saying, look, you know, this is supposed to be a founders group of entrepreneurs. We want to know where the business opportunities are. So let's move away from this macro picture because this is really relevant to policymakers and, and it's a great chart, but this one is better if you're trying to understand it from the strategy side. This is also from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and it's a framework called the Resolve Framework. And basically what it is, is it's just a, a group of categories 
and so the, it's an acronym, right? Uh, and in each each category essentially reflects a number of different activities, strategic activities that firms can embrace in order to uh, attempt to leverage their knowledge in the circular economy and the principles of circularity into enhanced profitability. So I won't I won't talk too much about this this chart here, um, other than to say I'm going to go through each one of these uh, you know individually, and I'm going to give you uh, some case study examples because I think that that helps to uh, to bring it home, and it it will hopefully help to spark your thinking in terms of you know what what types of strategies you might be able to employ in your own company in order to take advantage of the circular economy. So. Okay, so we're going through the resolve framework. The first one is regenerate. And in regenerate, uh, the, the best example I can come up with uh, to describe what this strategy is, is it's essentially a strategy of taking a waste resource and thinking about how you can use that resource in order to enhance another part of either society, your company, your community, etc. So here's a great example. This is a carpet company called Interface. It's a U.S. carpet company, but they've got a they've got a branch in Sydney, and um, it, they developed this program called Networks. And the idea behind it is they contract with villages in developing nations, and predominantly this started, I believe, in the Philippines. And they make contracts with the villagers to retrieve some of the old fishing nets that wind up being, you know, a, a hazard in a maritime environment. And they collect all the fishing nets and they bring them back to a central location and they repelletize them and they turn them into carpeting. So here's a fantastic example of a, you know, of a company that, you know, basically has taken a, a planetary hazard and turned it into a, a useful material. And, you know, here's a, I don't know if you can see this, but here's a great example of, of that type of carpeting. And the bottom, this, the bottom underlay here is actually made from pet bottle fibers. So just pet bottles that have been broken, repelletized and, and turned into a thread. Interesting, right? And, and some of you might be thinking, well, wait, how is that possible? You know, you, you know, a pet bottle into thread, that doesn't make sense. It actually should make inherent sense because at the end of the day, synthetic textiles are actually oil byproducts, right? They're made from petroleum byproducts. And so it's not much different than, you know, the, the oil that's embedded in an organic, uh, you know, such as, such as uh, you'd find in a pet bottle. Here's another example of, of regenerative thinking. Look at Milan. It's a beautiful city, historically. It's got some wonderful art, tremendous food. Not exactly the nicest city to look at if you're an environmentalist, though. Uh, and yet, here's a, a developer who said, I want to change things. And so they've decided to create a building based around the idea of a vertical forest. And you can actually Google this. If you Google these, uh, you know, this, this development, you'll, you'll see some interviews with people who have taken up residency in these places. And, you know, they're over the moon about it because it's a completely different world when they come home now. Uh, rather than, you know, they still get the joys of, of Milan, but they come home and it's just a complete, you know, passive, you know, down to earth existence. So that's regenerative. Now, so the question you might, might be asking is, is, is there something that we have in our waste streams that, you know, we can use for benefiting others in society? And, you know, maybe there's a way that we can actually sell that into uh, society. Here's the next one, sharing. And sharing, you know, there's lots of wonderful examples of that. And here's, here's a classic one, which is, you know, we're seeing a lot in terms of uh, shared textiles, right? So the idea of shared fashion. And so here's a company called Rent the Runway. It's a U.S. company. There's a whole bunch of these all around the world. The idea behind it is that you, you buy a subscription. Uh, you know, you get four or five outfits that'll last you for the month and you cycle through them. And then at the end of the month, you send them back and you get another four or five uh, articles of clothing. Now, the reason I wanted to introduce this under sharing and for those of you who are thinking, hmm, what kind of 
uh, assets do we have that are underutilized that we could actually take advantage of in sharing? Or better yet, is there an asset in the community that's underutilized that maybe I can take advantage of for my company? Uh, and so really a lot of the things that are happening in the innovation hub, the whole principle of, of you know, the Eastern Innovation Hub is really to have a sharing space, right? To maximize the use of that space. But it's not just about maximizing the use of the space, is it? And this is the point that I want to make about the sharing economy. So it's great to be, you know, sharing something, but if there isn't a social connection, what's the point? It, it's not sustainable. And so, you know, when you think about your very own Eastern Innovation Business Center, what you've got there is you've got a bunch of entrepreneurs who have different views of the world who are connecting with each other and talking about their business challenges and hopefully connecting in a way that will lead to new and exciting collaborations. This thing, uh, my guess is we're not going to see this in 10 years. And the reason we're not going to see it in 10 years is because customers can't connect with this type of model. But here's a great example of sharing that does work. Melbourne Repair Cafes. So think about what this cafe does. If you're not familiar with it, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a number of these that have sprung up around town. And the idea is, is that you can pay a subscription. You come in and you, know, you can bring, your, you can bring your, your broken items and people that can fix them will help you. And uh, you know, in, in that way, there's also a, a social component. And that's the important part about the sharing element of the circular economy is that this gives us an opportunity to connect with each other. And that's very true in, in Melbourne's Repair Cafe because there's a lot of people that are coming in to help people on, and fix their electronics, for example, who are lonely. And this is, this is the, you know, the big part of their day. This is their part, uh, part their chance to connect. So another good example of sharing that, that works, Blah Blah Car, which is a French firm. So the idea is if you're in Venlo, Netherlands and you want to go to Bruges in, in, in Belgium, you type that in and you hit search for a trip and if there's somebody else that's going there, you can connect with them and you can share the ride for a fee. But what's great about this is that as soon as the two people, the driver and the passenger get into the car together, they immediately have a connection, don't they? The connection is they're going to the same destination. So suddenly now we've got a discussion that, that can go on and it, and it becomes a much more social engagement. So that's sharing. So the question you want, might want to ask yourself in sharing again is, do we have underutilized assets that we can be using with others? Third one is optimizing. And this is a great example. And <laughs> I, I, I feel so sheepish to, to be to be delivering this but you know i when i work with companies what we do is we go into we we go in i always do a site survey before i engage with companies because i want to see what they're doing uh and i want to be able to have some some clear ideas of, of how we can help them so here's a picture here of a famous supermarket chain in australia which will be unnamed but it I suspect will be given away by the color of this young lad's shirt. Um, now, as you can see, the young lad is standing over a, you know, right now an, an empty bin. Now that's of course not for toilet paper. Um, that is the seafood section. And uh, that's the, the bin uh, where you used to have some ice and upon the ice you would have some fish. And so the fish have now been packed away. They want to clean the place up and, and, and go home. So he's standing there with a hose full of hot water and he's hosing down the ice and he, then he wants to wipe off the trays and go home. So I took this in to see this uh, company that will be uh, unnamed. And I, I put up this photo and I said, you know, I lived in Japan for 15 years. And in Japan, when you visit someone, you have to give them a, a present, an omiyage. And so I said, I'm giving you an omiyage. Uh, here's this photo and put it up. I said, it's worth $5 million, you're welcome. And they said, what? And I said, look, we time this person. You take the person's time, 
multiply that by his wage. You multiply that, you add to that the cost of the hot water. You add to that the cost of the energy that went into the ice. Multiply that by 365 days. Multiply that by 810 stores, and you've got a $5 million problem on your hands. And we haven't even started talking about what we could do with the ice yet. And what's really interesting to me, and I said this to them, I said, is that, you know, despite the fact that you're a very sophisticated organization, you have scientists everywhere looking at ways that you can, you know, optimize your operations. I guarantee you, you probably have floor supervisors who will walk by this young guy at some stage of the process, tap him on the back and say, good job, Joe. And so that's the point of the circular economy is a lot of times these types of optimizing solutions are beyond the scope of regular business consciousness. It's just not a frame that the company uses for, you know, exploring these types of wasted efforts. And um, I, I, I can tell you right now, I've been into a lot of companies in my time and I've never ever being able to, I've never ever faced a company where I've walked in and I said, oh, I can't find anything, sorry. Here's another good example. So same, I, now I'm picking on this store. I'm, I'm so sorry, um, but it serves them right for doing all the stickies. Um, so here's a, here's, here's a great example of, you know, just irrational behavior that occurs in operations that just sort of happens simply because we're busy doing other things and we haven't really thought this through. So the bottom photo where you can see the sign that says meet, what that is, is it's a wonderful new system of putting doors on your coolers, which is going to save literally millions of dollars for this company, right? Okay, now the exact same store up to the left, you can see new equipment, so they've just purchased it, and yet they've decided that they're not gonna put doors on this. Now, if you ask them, they, they would say, oh yeah, yeah, there's a marketing thing, you know, and, and they would probably get into something like, well, you know, people that buy meat, they don't mind going opening doors, uh, but people, people that, you know, buy cheese, they're, they're fickle, they, they won't open a door, I don't know. The point is, is that if you've acknowledged that your system is incorrect and you want to invest in new technology, why aren't you investing in new technology everywhere? So um, if you're asking, what should I do in terms of optimizing? How do I, how do I look for ways to do this? Um, one of the best ways to do it, you know, and I hate to say this is, you know, and I'm not suggesting that you phone me tomorrow or something, but is, is pulling in consultants because it, this is what consultants are good at in that they don't know your business. So they come in with these frames of reference that are different. Uh, and, uh, you know, another way to do it is to get involved in these types of circular economy workshops where you're, you know, being challenged with different business models from uh, different uh, colleagues. Okay, loop. So here's an interesting example of loop. I, loop is, is the thing that's typically associated with uh, circular economy and, and strategies. But this is a great example. In, in 2005, I think it was, I, I set up a company at, at the National University of Singapore. It was a social venture called uh, Advanced Clean Energy Solutions, ACES. Yeah, there's four of us. Um, anyway. The idea was we were consulting with companies and trying to help them to, you know, uh, solve their energy problems through a circularity lens. So my colleague went and consulted on this uh, meat processing plant in, in the outskirts of Jakarta. Now it's it's around dinner, so I don't want to get into too much of the detail here, but the workings of a meat processing plant are quite simple, aren't they? You've got a bunch of cows, and they trundle into a building. And in the building, something really bad happens to them. And then out through the back door come these succulent beef steaks, right? But while all this is happening, you get produced uh, a ton of this stuff down the bottom left. Uh, and that's, that's, that's called tallow. Now in agrarian societies, tallow is a, was a source for candle making because it's a fat. 
And so people used to take the towel oil, <laughs> stuff it into a jar, put in a wick, light it, and they're off and running. So since you can, you can use this as a, as a source of fuel, we determined that we could, um, you know, we could turn it into a biofuel. So my colleague who has a laboratory that works on this st stuff, he actually did the numbers. And it turns out that we could take all of that product off their hands uh, and digest it into a biofuel, which could then be used to run their electricity generator for the entire year. So we asked them, what's the cost that you have of disposing of this tallow? They said, oh, it's costing us $100,000 a year. I said, okay, what's your electricity cost? A million dollars a year. Really? Wow. So $1.1 million in savings. Why didn't they come up with this? Beyond the scope of regular business consciousness. Here's another good example of looping um, is a new bull workwear. This is a company that operates in Denmark. It makes uh, uniforms for hospitals. Uh, they've been around for over 100 years. They're a crown uh, company uh, in terms of the, the Danish crown. And they, uh, they've they actually started to do some research on new types of material. And I wanted to bring this along in terms of looping because here's a great example. Um, you know, they, they have adopted a brand called Reprieve, which if those of you are interested in seeing this up close, you can actually go into your neighborhood Target store because Target carries this brand. But basically what this brand is, is it's a brand that's made out of used pet bottles. You take the pet bottles, pelletize them, turn them into yarn, uh, uh, turn them into shirts. And the great thing about that is that you could then take them from the, from the process, you can collect them back again, repelletize them, and the process goes on again. A wonderful way of, of, of creating an entire new product line out of waste, right? Here's a great company. And I actually brought a sample here because this picture isn't very clear. This is uh, Troll Tech, this company. And I don't know if you can see this clearly. I'll put this up here. Hopefully you can see the, uh, the gaps that exist here. Now, this is a, a tile that is made out of uh, essentially uh, uh, shavings of wood and then it gets uh, put together with with plaster and it becomes an acoustic tile for that reason you know you can imagine that the sound enters in here and it certainly doesn't come out easily so you know th this company um, we were engaging with in a program called rethink business because uh, this company was, uh, it already had this product, but what it was looking for was a way to do this with construction waste. You know, is there a way that we can take all this construction waste that exists? By the way, in Australia, that's about a third of all, all waste. Can we take that and reconstitute the wood into this type of product? Pretty exciting, right? Think about that, by the way. So, you know, sparking thinking. What this should be doing is it, it should be sparking thinking about, you know, how you can apply some of this. Um, you know, we had a discussion about this and I was thinking about those, uh, those soundboards, the acoustic soundboards that they put up on highways. They're absolutely useless, right? Uh, but imagine if you could have a, you know, a, some sort of uh, plasticized version of this uh, so that it could withstand the heat and, you know, have that on the side of highways. This type of thinking is, you know, is something that can be transferred to other applications. So, virtualize. Well, uh, this will be short, but it's important that you think about this because there's a whole bunch of things that, you know, that we could be doing online and we're, we're all finding out about this now, right? All of the things that we've been doing the last couple of weeks, we were probably we would probably have said two months ago, ah, it's impossible, or ah, it's a waste of time, or ah, it's inefficient. And the thing is, you adapt and you begin to become more proficient. And as you do, you find out that some of your new innovations suddenly are enhancing what used to be or what now is an obsolete draconian practice. So I mean, think about Netflix, right? I mean, I. 
I'm sure, I, I, I hope most of you are, are old enough to remember this. I certainly do. You know, taking those, those lovely VHS tapes into the video store. Uh, you know, here I'm going to return it. And then they charge you an extra dollar because you didn't rewind it. And then you go to get your other video and, and it's, it's, it's rented out. And so now you've got to watch the same video that you watched last week. And, you know, it's just, that was life before Netflix. So, uh, bless you, Netflix. Dating sites. Think about that. You know, think about just how you know, obstructive, how unpleasant, how angst ridden the whole process used to be. And now, you know, in the whole safety of your, of your, of your home, you can sort of scope out the competition. You can scope out the new partners and, you know, make your decisions in a step-by-step -step process. You know, these are all evolutions of services that used to be all delivered in physical spaces. So what we, I think, really should be asking ourselves is what is this model going to look like? And indeed, I've been asking myself this in terms of the circular economy because all of my work um, or much of my work revolves around design thinking workshops. And I bring groups of people together to, you know, work on different design thinking lenses to innovate new products. And one of the problems with that, of course, is that we can't do it anymore. So how do we do this online? And I'm convinced that by the time we get through this process of all being, you know, shut-ins, that I'm going to have a, an entirely new model that will probably be even better than the old model. So it just takes some time thinking through all of this. Last one, exchange. And this, I always end on something that allows me to get up on a soapbox. So there you go. I'm, I'm getting up on my soapbox for this. Ryobi, the Japanese, uh, you know, power tool company. R-Y-O-B-I, Ryobi. Never buy anything from them ever again, please. Okay, so here's the story. I, I bought a, uh, a power drill in Japan. It cost me 5,000 yen. So what's that, about $60, right? Really happy with it, so I'm, I'm kidding. You, you, you don't want to completely turn you away from them. Um, so I buy this, buy this power drill. A couple of years go by and I haven't used it, so it's all my fault, but the battery dies and I can't recharge it again, so I need a, a new replacement. So I go online to buy a new replacement and the replacement battery for this is $65. I bought the whole thing for 60. The replacement battery was 65. And I thought, this is crazy. I'm a tinkerer. I like doing this anyway. So I took the thing apart, looked at how many batteries it's going to take and said, okay, you know what? That's it. I'm going to, I'm going to fix this thing. Went online. Nickel cadmium battery. There it is. What? 947 for one. So five is going to cost me, you know, $47 plus a, a soldering iron. And I thought, oh, this is crazy. So what did I do? I went down to Big W and I bought this 18 volts. So my old one was seven. This one is an 18 volt cordless drill driver, two years, uh, two years warranty, paid $30 for it. The point that I'm trying to make with this is that there's a whole bunch of us out there that are lurking now that really hate these types of strategies when companies start to invoke these planned obsolescence. And we really love companies that will go overboard to try to make sure that they maintain your business by, you know, helping you, you know, progressively spend money, yes, but not, you know, leave you with a bunch of garbage at the end of the process. So think about what Xerox does right? Xerox takes all of your spent cartridges. No problem. You just send them in the pack that we, that we produce for you. Send them back to us. We'll send you a new one. Two minutes, Scott. Okay. So this is the, you know, this is the point about the exchange society is that as you begin to think about your products and how you would wish, wish to develop them, put some thought into the knowledge that there's a whole bunch of customers out there that would really benefit and would really be loyal to you if you thought about how you delivered your products. Uh, you know, here's a good example. In, in Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam, Philips, they don't sell their lights to Schiphol. What do they do? They actually sell lumens. 
So a certain amount of light in certain areas, they contract with Schiphol, and then they provide all of the lights, all of the fixtures, and they maintain this. So Schiphol doesn't need to do anything. They just need to define how many lumens they want. How about that for an interesting way of delivering a service that used to be a product? And I'm almost finished with this, Daniel. Last one is Fairphone. So, you know, look at the Fairphone. I, I don't know if any of you know this, you can Google it. It's a, it's a Dutch company, but here's a company that, you know, not only allows you to take their phones apart, but they actually have videos to show you how to do so. So then you can remove parts that aren't working. They have diagnostic videos. You can send them in and get the thing repaired. And what this has done in many nations is it's created these, you know, sort of neighborhood repair shops where even if you don't want to do it, you can go to the repair shop and they'll do it because everything's online for them. Now, contrast that to Apple, who winds up, you know, sending you upgrades to all of your devices so that they can, they can ruin your ability to connect on the internet. So you have to buy new devices from them. Bless them. That's it, folks. That's all I wanted to say. I, I mean, I think it's more important for us to have a chat. And, um, you know, but I, I think Danielle will be talking to you a little bit about the circular advantage. And so just if, can Danielle, can I quickly uh, throw in a... Absolutely. A, a, okay, a quick promo on this. It's only two slides. Um, this is a, a program with Hume and the city of Kingston. And what we've decided to do is to help companies understand what the circular economy is, work with them to innovate circular economy strategies. It is heavily subsidized by Hume and Kingston. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to not only create uh, roadmaps, but, but also to create some short-term wins so that you walk away from this process saying, wow, this thing is really meaningful. Um, we're gonna create case studies and videos uh, about all of the companies that were involved to promote this. It'll be the first of its kind in Australia. And it was all going to be uh, uh, structured around workshops uh, until recently. And now it's going to be all delivered online through a platform called Canvas. And I'm currently creating the program as we speak. And so, as I said, it's going to start hopefully in April, if not, maybe May, a uh, seven-month project. If you're interested, bang, there's the information. So if you write, if, if you have a, uh, a shop in Hume, uh, write to Ian Davies uh, at the address here. If not, write to Angela Stubbs. And if you're interested and you're neither, uh, write to Danielle and, and we'll see if we can't find a way to hook you up. Yeah, we can probably make that happen, become a yep. virtual uh, in the middle somewhere. Hey, thanks, Scott. And I know yep. a few people have got some questions, so let's jump straight in so we don't um, take up too much time because I could right. comment for hours. Cam, you were off mute for a second. You had a question for Scott? Um, no, I was okay. I was just sort of um, getting my head around all that um, the, pre the wonderful presentation, Scott. It's, it's really in-depth and it's getting um, better every time I hear it. So <laughs> you always get that. You always get that um, little chunk of gold that you, that makes it special every time. So, no, well, well done. Really, really great presentation. Scott, I've got a question for you. Just while I know a couple of people who are online and I know a couple of people have tried to do some really innovative stuff and sometimes the market's just not ready for it. Sometimes we don't have the resources, we don't have the financial backing just to, you know, be a BHP and throw out a new product. Um, I, sometimes there's just a little bit of magic what are some of your advice to some of the smaller guys that have said, you know, I really want to make a difference. I want to try something. I want to build something. I've tried something. It didn't work. How, give me one or two tips that are the, like, what are the things that are going to help them succeed? Wow. Great question. Um, I, I think my, my tip would be monitor the environment really carefully. Um, so, you know, here in Victoria, for example, uh, the government's just announced a $300 million recycling strategy. Uh, in, in that, they have now you know, started to catalyze a number of, of different um, grant uh, opportunities that you can access through Sustainability Victoria. And you know, those things you know, make it clear what the government is trying to achieve. And, and the reason the government is trying to achieve uh, progress in those areas is because it's important to somebody. 
and because they see markets for that. So that's the first thing is, you know, tap into what the government is promoting because sure enough, you're going to find, um, you know, opportunities. The I second, just, yeah, I just saw that today. Sorry, just to jump in for anyone who's interested. If you've got anything to do with e-waste recycling, if you've got any interest in running e-waste centers, there's a very large grant at the moment out across government for that. Yeah, I, the, the, the second thing is um, tap in. So my, my, it's going to be three. Uh, second thing is tap into um, you know, your councils. Um, it, it's some, there are some really brilliant people that are working in the councils. Um, you know, often I know we, we're very critical of the government, and, and, but the council to me is, are the folks in the trenches. And, you know, um, they always have ideas. And so whether it's through the councils or through the, you know, the, the innovation centers. So Danielle, you have one, there's, there's, there's one uh, up in Hume, for example. You know, there's a few that are dotted around town. These are all really valuable resources for people. So, you know, I'd, I'd like to encourage people to, you know, to take advantage of, of that for sure. Uh, and, and then, you know, the third area is, is really, um, you know, connecting through uh, groups that are doing things that, you know, will help to spark interest and help to connect you. A good example of that is, is Sean Truick, who, who's joined us. Uh, now, Sean uh, heads up, uh, you know, Circular Economy Victoria, and they run regular workshops and meetings where people come in and talk about challenges that they face in the circular economy. What a great way to, you know, to meet some like-minded people, but also to sort of spark each other's interest. Yeah, that's a really great comment. Um, Richard's yeah. just said, seems to me you could take that ship all old airport lumens model and apply it to solar power generation with watts per hours. Yes, yes. certainly. Um, gosh, I forget the company and I, I that's terrible that I, that I have. Out of it, Hume? No, no, there's, there's a, actually, I, I went to a barbecue the other day <laughs> to this guy. Um, he's got, um, he's, he's got something like a 250 megawatt, um, solar farm in, in Victoria and one in Queensland. And he's actually selling renewable energy to anybody who wants it, you know, and his, his model is a community based model. So the idea is you, you contract directly with him and they, they sort it out for you. Um, so yeah, for sure, for sure, energy would be ideal for this. Now, now Scott, um, nobody else has popped their hand up to ask a question yet. So, and if you do, just cut across me, and um, we'll have time for one more. Sure. Um, do you? Uh, I, I'd see a real opportunity for a group of people to get together on Zoom in the next week, just with you. Perhaps you can reach out to our community and do a bit of a bit of a brainstorm, maybe a bit of an ideation piece. Maybe if you'd like a group to test your ideation. So I'm sure everyone would like, would be really interested in that. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm always happy to chat through these, to be honest. Um, mm. I, you know, I, I often, you know, look, these are early days. Um, and the, the ethos of our firm is such that, you know, we're, we're not out to, you know, to, to you know, to make a quick buck off of anybody. Um, so I just frankly won't work with anybody if I don't think we can help. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if you've, if you've got some, some ideas that you want to kick around, um, and I'll, I'll just go up three more. Uh, so that's my email address there. Drop me a line. Um, you know, I'll, I'm happy to chat through it, at least in the first instance to, uh, you know, to, to, you know, to weigh whether or not there's something that we can do to help. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. It's been really great having you online. What I'm going to do right now is um, I'm just going to say look, our deep thanks to you. We've only got 10 more minutes and we want to have a bit of a hot seat session. So don't go anywhere. Um, but I, what I want to, what I really want to do right now is finish the recording because I think it's appropriate if we have a bit of a hot seat session that it's not recorded. <laughs> um, so I'm asking anybody on our line of our 30 participants that are online. Again, we're really grateful that you're here. This is our first Eastern Vic Founders meet up online. I promise you we'll go back face to face at some time. And for those amazing people that are uh, who are in Germany, who are in New Zealand, who are in Hong Kong right now, and all the places that you are, or even just not very close to Mulgrave, we're going to try and work out how we can do both. So you can um, join us each month, both digitally and physically, when we can get back to physical. Uh, so once again, Scott, 
our massive thanks to you. I'm going to click stop on the recording and uh, we're just going My to continue pleasure. live.